G'day viewers. In this segment we'll cover a very brief history of the internet. So you can see here I've shown you a rough timeline for the internet and it goes from say let's call it 1970 to today so we're spanning more than uh, four decades here. Um, and over that period of time I've drawn three main phases that I'm going to talk about as the internet having gone through an ARPANET phase, an NSFNET phase and really the modern internet and web as we know it today. Throughout those phases the internet has grown enormous, enormously. In fact from every phase to the next we have about a factor of a thousand growth um, which is just huge. So from the end of the ARPANET from a, a thousand uh, through to you know, a billion hosts today and this is all very rough. We can go into more detail um, as you'd like. There are many resources you can read to find out a little more about this. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about each phase. So in the beginning there was the ARPANET. The ARPANET was a, a network that was built and sponsored by the US Department of Defense. It was the precursor to the internet, so it became the internet. This network was motivated for resource sharing. Uh, obtaining access to some you know, early and relatively powerful for those days computers from uh, offices at different locations. It was actually launched with uh, just you know, a modest four nodes in 1969 and during the ARPANET phase it grew up to be hundreds of hosts. And in fact during this phase one of the first killer apps in the internet emerged. It was email. Um, this was not what the network was intended for. It was intended for resource sharing but email which was written just a, a, a small a handful of years after the ARPANET was born uh, became very popular as people used it to exchange messages. During this time uh, there were several key influences. So I've shown here some key influences leading up to the creation of the internet. And one of the key influences here is what is called packet switching. Packet switching is something that was pioneered by Donald Davies in the UK and Len Kleinrock in the United States amongst others. And packet switching was really interesting. It's really just the notion of packets and sending through networks is what we would think of today. It's interesting because it's quite different than the circuit switching which was used as part of the telephone network at that time. The whole notion was to organize information in small units of packets through which they were sent through the network. And this could be much more efficient for connecting computers together than using telephone circuits which are maybe good for people because computer traffic is very bursty. So we might sometimes have many packets but often there'd be no packets. So dedicating a whole circuit would be wasteful. Whereas if we use packets we'll get the advantages of statistical multiplexing that we talked about in terms of getting better use out of the links. So this was one key influence. Another key influence was that of decentralized control. Uh, from the early efforts of Paul Barrett who produced various designs that uh, emphasized decentralized control. In those days the telephone network was organized very hierarchically so that if you took out a high layer node you would really paralyze a lot of the network. Being able to create networks where control was fully decentralized so that if you blew up a portion the rest of the network could continue to function was obviously something that was very appealing to the military at the time. And so this is often why you hear of the internet and uh, the ARPANET being created to withstand a, a nuclear war in which a portion of it was lost. But really this is just one of the influences leading up to it. As the ARPANET took off in the very early internet another key influence became paramount and that was internetworking. Internetworking here was pioneered by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn shown here in their pictures. Um, internetworking is all about connecting different networks together into a single larger network. Surf and Khan pioneered it uh, fairly early on in the ARPANET starting in uh, like 74 and this later became uh, the TCP and IP protocols. So really the key idea of internetworking is that uh, we, we have different network technologies. One way you could build a big network is by getting everyone to use the same technology mandating it. Uh, but Surf and Khan realized that this was infeasible already. There were packet radio net networks, satellite networks um, and the ARPANET. They're all different kinds of technologies there. Surf and Khan instead uh, proposed to use a higher layer of interconnection to a level of indirection if you will to combine all of these different networks together. And they solved the problems which are required to be able to internetwork these technologies. For this achievement they're popularly known as the fathers of the internet and they've received many awards for this. 
Okay, so here's an early geographical map and a network topology map for the ARPANET. It comes from around 1978. You can see by now the ARPANET has grown up a fair bit, although by today's standards it's still a very small network. There are all of these different uh, circles, these, these are different kinds of nodes. They were known as IMPs. This was the name for the early router. I think that's IMP is an internet message processor. And the links between things, well here's a link here, uh, they ran at 56 kilobits per second. So you, know, so you can see we've got a network here which is growing up. As it grew up, and now we passed on to I guess thousands of different nodes, um, as it grew up the NSF uh, commissioned a network which played a key role and this was called NSFNet. The ARPANET really connected people who were doing business with the US Department of Defense. And there were many other players who didn't have a contract with the US Department of Defense who wanted to be able to connect using this interesting newfangled technology. And so the NSF built a network which would allow all different kinds of educational institutions, universities, to connect to this network. Initially, this network connected uh, supercomputers at different sites together. But eventually it connected many different sites and it became the backbone for all internet traffic effectively replacing the ARPANET. It's during this period, this was a tremendous growing up period, this period of a, of a decade or more. It's during this period that the classic internet protocols as we know today emerged. All of TCP IP, the DNS and the Sockets API emerged around 83, quite a year I guess. Um, and internet routing in the form of BGP, that's a protocol we'll get to later in the course, took a little longer to emerge in the modern form that we recognize, but it was around by 93. During this period also, there was tremendous growth in interest in computing and networking technologies. The personal computer was really coming into its own, and personal computers appeared, uh, or computers appeared, and then became personal computers, first really on uh, campuses, educational institutions for research. As they became effective, they made their way into businesses, and eventually in the form of personal computers into homes. So it's not just personal computers, uh, computing, but networking technology, Ethernet, the uh, most popular form of local area networking emerged um, in this period too and it uh, took off like wildfire allowing all of these early computers to be connected and so the result is that by about 93 we had maybe a million hosts that were all connected together as part of the internet it's growing up. Here's the architecture of this early um, internet um, when the NSFNet was in use. And you can see this picture here is really, it's meant to just be very simple and hierarchical. The NSFNet here is the backbone. What that means is if the two customers in different places want to communicate with one another, uh, a local customer network might be a university network, would send packets up to its regional network, which would send packets to the NSF backbone network, which would send packets down which would carry packets, I guess, across the country and deliver them to the right regional network, which would carry packets to the right customer network, and we would achieve connectivity. Now, the early NSF network backbone, you can see here just the speeds it used. It started off with 56 kilobit per second links. Fairly quickly, it upgraded to 1.5 megabit per second links, um, and then to 45 megabit per second links. So the network was really growing uh, quite fast in terms of speed as well as in terms of size. Well, after a decade or so of all of this growth and the popular technologies in computing and networking, we arrive at the birth of the modern internet, um, which contains the internet and the web as we know it today, is really a continuation of what was started here. And this was around the, uh, the early 90s. There are two major changes I want to point out to you uh, compared to the earlier structure. Now, the, the first is that after around 95, uh, connectivity was no longer provided by the single NSFNet backbone. Instead, connectivity is provided by large ISPs. There are several different large ISPs, handfuls of them, and they are providing connectivity to people across the wide area and they're also competing with each other as business. So there are now multiple players at that top level. And the way we're making sure that packets get everywhere is that all of these uh, different players, these large players, interconnect at IXPs, Internet Exchange Points, so that they're able to exchange traffic and get it anywhere on the Internet. And uh, later, large content providers also come along and connect into these ISPs, IXPs, so that they can distribute content all over the internet. 
So that's one change, the way we route across the internet and, and the architecture of the internet. And another big change is really the web. The web, which was pioneered by uh, this man over here, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, emerged, it burst onto the scene really because it took off so rapidly. It emerged around 93 and it really took off in terms of traffic and uh, it caused a lot of interest in the, uh, the internet. Everyone wanted to get on it. The growth led to the formation of what are called content distribution networks to be able to efficiently distribute all of this content. Naming became much more of a concern and this led to the establishment of the body called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names, later on, around 98. Uh, the content has continued to evolve ever since. Um, most bits now actually are video that's going over the Internet, just because videos are so large. And most of the traffic is uh, soon to be going over wireless networks. Um, and probably from mobile devices. Not quite yet, uh, but it's uh, skewing rapidly in this direction. And really the new kinds of content are driving the internet. That's where we are today. And I'll skip all of the, the later, um, you know, Facebook and everything, because I'm sure you're more familiar with the evolution of these particular companies in the internet ecosystem. Really, it's the web and the continuation of the web that they're providing. Um, and finally, I just want to show you the modern internet architecture. So this picture here is to contrast with your uh, previous picture of the NSF network backbone. You can see here I have the IXPs as the point of interconnection and different transit providers. Here's a transit provider. This is like a big ISP. Connect to different ISPs, IXPs and content providers also connect to the IXPs. So what you might have now is that you might have the case that uh, content is going from here through an IXP to a transit provider and then down to a particular customer. Um, or we, we might uh, be sending traffic from this customer here. If this customer wants to get traffic to the other customer, we might go up through the transit network and then we might go uh, through to uh, the transit ISP, then we might go to an IXP and be routed to another transit provider who we would then send traffic down and let's say now we're going to this customer. So you can see they all fit together in a rather different architecture with no single backbone up at the top. That's the defining characteristic of today's internet architecture. Okay.